Good morning, everyone. Lori, let's give it a couple of seconds. And let some people come in. Good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Do you know it's what next year, next week's and this week is kind of the last week of October. I was going to say next week, but it's really only a day next week. I'm looking at the calendar and I'm starting to plan out November and December. I'm amazed. We're like almost done with this year. It's, it's, yeah, it's pretty insane. It, what, the crazy part was, is that Halloween hasn't gotten here yet, but there's been a Christmas tree lot setting up not far from our house for the past, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I know, I know. I swear. I always say that. I think it's getting sooner. I think it's getting sooner. Well, I have a all-star lineup for the end of the year, so I will be talking about that as well. But boy, our numbers are climbing. Lauren, yes, this are. is awesome. So yes, excited to have everybody here. This is <laughs> great. Well, I will let you get started so we can rock and roll this morning, Lauren. Okay, perfect. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I'll do a quick intro and then we'll dive into the show. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the SBDC or the Small Business Development Center. And we're a national program with over a thousand locations across the country. And we offer no cost services to local small businesses. Now our services are at no cost to you because your tax dollars have already taken care of our fees. For the Los Angeles Network, we have locations throughout the Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. And you can see our centers located on the map in front of you. You'll see we're as far out as Camarillo, Santa Clarita, over to Pasadena, all the way down to Long Beach. So if you're in any of those areas, please be sure to get in contact with one of our centers. Again, you'll wanna do so because we offer no cost business advising. And so you're able to sit one-on-one -on -one via Zoom with a expert in various fields. We have experts in the fields of marketing and finance. You might even have a chance to sit with our guru of all numbers, Ms. Lori Williams, um, as well as uh, let's see whatever other topics, business planning, licensing and permitting, uh, you name it, we've got the content for you or we've got the content expert, excuse me, for you. And then uh, when it comes to virtual trainings, we have offered tons of trainings, much like the training or the show you have joined today. So be sure to get in contact with us so you can get started. We'd love to help you. You can uh, reach out to us by phone 866-588-7232, or you can go online, smallbizla.org forward slash new client. For those of you who have reached us this morning and you are outside of the Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, or Ventura counties, please go to americasbdc.org forward slash find your SBDC and uh, you'll be able to get connected with a center close to you. So let's see, quick housekeeping. Um, for those of you who have any questions, let's be sure we put those into the Q&A. Again, questions into the Q&A. Let's reserve the chat. Good morning, Emma, <laughs> and everyone else who's in there. Yolanda, Stephanie, Lori, I see you. Good morning, Teresa. Um, let's leave the chat for greetings as well as um, important information that Lori would like to share with you, links for upcoming shows, as well as I'll be putting in some notes sometimes. Lori will say, hey, Lauren, drop that into the chat. And so you can check the chat for that too. Good morning, Kitty. Oh, she said, thanks for all you do. Thank you. Thanks for coming every week. We love seeing your faces. Uh, so with that, good morning to our frequent flyers, as Lori likes to call you all, likes to see you again. And then good morning to all of you who are new to our show. Uh, Lori, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Awesome. Okay, so Lauren's going to put these into the chat. I am launching my last for the year, not last, but the last for the year financial literacy. I wasn't going to do one, but I have had so many requests. I decided to kind of spread it out through November and December. So I've just set it up. The links are now live. Lauren's going to put that in there. Once again, um, session two is a rather new one that's turning out to be quite popular. What I'm doing in that session is I'm using a very simple just Excel document where I'm creating a model and I'm explaining the minimum information you must know about your company, be it a service or a product business. I'm going over how to calculate your gross profit, how to use percentages, and then 
session three is a deeper dive into how you use percentages and performance measurements to do better decision making. So session one is kind of basic going over accounting, bookkeeping, what you need to know, filling out tax returns, et cetera. So you can skip session one if you want. Session two and session three do kind of work in a nice order, but you can jump in on any. Now, actually tomorrow I'm doing my legal structure webinar. Um, you know, as the frequent flyers have been here, there's a lot of confusion going on between sole props and LLCs. I'm getting a lot of people who are saying to me, I, I started an LLC for tax advantages. And I have to explain, no, that's not actually the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on sole props, LLCs, and S corporations. And I'm just going to talk about the tax differences, why somebody often chooses one over another, what kind of documents you have to do, how you do tax estimates and reasonable salary requirements. And that's coming up tomorrow. Then as far as upcoming shows, I've got... Next week, we've got Julius Hertz coming on, and her company is, I, I, I like to read her sentence on her website. It's not about being perfect. It's knowing what to do in any situation, and she works a lot with entrepreneurs. And you know, as a new entrepreneur or been around for a while, you end up in these situations and you're like, how can I figure out what's the best way to respond rather than react? And she's going to come on the show and talk a bit about that. November 16th, Barney Sanchez, which is a PCC um, SBDC advisor, as well as one of the visionaries and people involved in In Boulevard Market, which is in beautiful downtown Montebello. Now, some time ago, we had Sylvia Garcia come on, and she was talking about Barney's new venture that the program he did and then the launch that she did in Boulevard Market. So Barney Santos, Santos, I got Santos. Thank you, Annie. Got a typo in there. Barney Santos is going to come on and he is going to talk about a whole lot of things. He's going to talk about everything from advising at the PCC, as well as what is in Boulevard Market, what his new company is doing, et cetera. And then November 30th, we got to have one of our favorites coming back on, Ariel Pie, he's going to talk about year-end marketing planning. And so when I look at the end of November and December, I'm going to go on this theme. And the theme is going to be all about getting ready for next year, looking at your marketing, auditing your legal, your financial capital, all of the aspects of helping to have a company successful. We're going to just do a kind of year-end cleanup and a get ready for 2023, because we need to have a good year. I'm sure everybody in the audience can understand what I'm saying. We all need to have a good year, but we also have to look at reality. You know, I'm big into reality and it's looking like there's gonna be some economic challenges going into next year. So I'm wanting everybody to kind of clean house, get their structures in place, to be prepared for whatever next year brings. So independent of what we're dealing with, we can all still have a good year. So that is my goal for the end of this year is to really bring the right people on and have the right discussions. And I'm in the process of lining up some more people and I'll be telling you about it. Now, speaking of people that have been on the show today before, Abby, who is on our show today, you might have remembered her coming on previously. She is the owner of Zizia Botanicas. It's an LA-based herbal company founded by clinical herbalist and artist, Abby Finley. Abby's dream has been to bring her products to marketplace. Now, in the process, she has learned how to produce the product through manufacturers, work with the distributors, and sell both wholesale and retail. Now, just recently, Abby launched a new product line. It's a collection of skincare balms. Abby's years of experience in product development, marketing, and distribution has really paid off. This product has become a great success. Abby's going to share with us how her focused approach has really paid off. Abby, welcome back to the show. Hi, Lori. Oh my God, it's so to good here. to see you. Okay, this is the new and improved and experienced Abby. So guys, I got to give you the background on this. I started working with Abby, oh my God, five years ago, Abby, six years ago, long yeah. time ago. 
Uh, somewhere about five years ago. And Abby was just starting out. And I, I just remember thinking, oh my God, this poor little girl, she's got to learn so much because this is a, a, a hard world she's entering into, but she had to drive, she had to drive. And so over the time period, we worked on numbers and financials and Excel sheets and making sure you spent the money. Pro I mean, we worked on everything, right? And so then um, just several months ago, May, um, actually started probably six months ago. You'll give me the time on this, but you, Abby comes up with this new product, right? So she goes to launch it and all of a sudden, and this is what I want to say, guys, this was Abby round two. This was a new and improved Abby. I noticed immediately a major difference from her focus, her understanding of what needed to be done. And I would say my, one of my expressions I like she got out of her own way and went after it without any of the, can I do it? Is this going to work, et cetera? So that was a really kind of just raw beginning, Abby, of saying where I think you are now. So first of all, I want to say congratulations. Secondly, we got to take people back to your company and the origin who has not seen the first show. So we're going to start out with, tell us a little bit about your company, how long you've been at it, how you got started. Let's start with the origin. All right. So I, my background is in visual art. And then about 10 years ago, I got into herbal medicine. Um, I studied and practiced with herbalists all over the country. I started making my own products. In the beginning, you know, I really, I was making these for my friends and family and community and people were really loving the results. Um, and really encouraging me to, you know, do my own thing. So five years ago, I decided to start Zizia, which actually just turned five like a week ago, which is, as we all know, a very big milestone in small business. Um, so that's exciting. And um, yeah, so I had no background in business and I just threw myself in. I got as many credit cards as I could get and max them all out and <laughs> and uh, started the journey of learning a lot. So uh, it's been an adventure. I started working with you, Lori, about about a month or two after I started the business. So okay. thankfully, I mean, you've been with me pretty much the whole time. You've really seen, uh, you've seen it. I have. I, I definitely have. And, you know, I have to I have to tell everybody in the audience, I am just so proud of Abby. You know, she I, she'll always be my little girl. My little girl will come from, you know, so far. So tell us about, you know, there's something interesting about the new product that you launched, because in some ways, or at least from my perspective, Abby, and you tell me, it was a little bit different than the products you had launched previously, a little different in the audience that it's marketed to, you know, a little broader in the audience. So tell us what the products are and, and let's talk about how they're just a little different than what you had been doing. Yeah, so the new product line is a collection of skincare balms. So these are topical products. They're made by combining oil and beeswax. So it's kind of like a salve or an ointment. And I package them in these really cute recyclable aluminum tubes. Um, and I, they also are the first product that has a really low price point. So prior to this, I, um, so I have about four different collections of products that I make. So, um, I make tinctures, I make drink mixes, I make herbal candies, and I make skincare. And the skincare line I was working on, uh, prior to developing this had a, had a much higher price point. Um, the packaging was a little more expensive. Um, it was just more expensive to produce the product um, overall. And so I started realizing that, you know, I've been doing retail with this product line for years and it wasn't really moving that well. And so I was just kind of like, you know, <clears throat> Lori, you and I had some hard conversations about you know, the reality of where I was trying to go and, you know, um, the product lines I was working on to do that and what the margins were. So I just, I didn't really have 
the right margins in place for the products that I was currently making. And so I had to, you know, it kind of came to like, am I going to keep going or could I create a new line that actually makes sense that has a good uh, margin? So that's kind of, you know, a long answer to that, but that's yeah, how I and you know, at it. What you're speaking of, Abby, right now, I think is really good to focus on for the audience to understand. So Abby had all of these different products and the products in themselves were great products, but you had a couple situations going on. One of them is they were expensive for you to produce and the packaging, et cetera. So when you looked at the cost and you looked at the selling price that she could get in the marketplace, she had very, very low gross profits. She would have had to sell so huge of a quantity. It was like light years before she was gonna start to make any kind of profit margins. So I kept, you know, and we would have these conversations where I would look at it and I would do these models and I'd say, you can't sell yourself into profitability People have heard me say that before, because as your sales went up, your cost of goods were going right up along with it. There was not any kind of cost effectiveness in volume, which is often the case, because even though it's your own product, you're paying for a manufacturer to manufacture it on your behalf. And so I kept saying, got to have new, you got to have higher gross profit, you got to have higher gross profit. I remember when you first told me about this new product line independent of what it is i just looked at it from a number perspective and suddenly you had like you said a lower price point that you didn't have to be in love with herbs in order to want to buy you know tinctures and stuff you know you you have a certain taste to it just by nature of that and so this was more of a cross you know different platform type product but the thing i really love is it was a inex less expensive, not inexpensive, but much less expensive to produce. And it still allowed you to have a good selling point. And you finally had a profit margin that I felt like we could work with. We could work with something. You were moving in that right direction. Why? Before we go down into, I want to go talk about your distribution and stuff, but for people in the audience, one of their biggest issues, especially when they're creating a product, Abby, is do I create it myself? Do I use a manufacturer? Do I use a manufacturer overseas? You know, all those questions, a commercial kitchen. You have gone down that road. I'm going to say this, Abby, you are painfully aware of all those questions because it's your due diligence and continuing to try to find the best means of production for your products that got you where they are today. So talk about just finding manufacturers and what you've had to do within your company to manufacture all of the products. Yeah, so I um, I still manufacture everything except my tinctures, um, and then very early on I offloaded that to a lab that you know specializes in uh, supplements, um, and I kind of just found that lab through word of mouth, uh, through you know people I was consulting with. But for the all the other products, I rent a commercial kitchen where I make them in, and that is having that access to that is huge because, um, you know, it's, it's a legit space to make my product in. It's clean. You know, the health department inspects it regularly. I have a health permit. It's doing all the right things. Um, and so that means that, you know, also I think part of switching to focus more on skincare came out of also the, the being realistic about manufacturing. Um, often when you start working with contract manufacturers, the minimums are so high. Yeah. I mean, we're talking like 100,000 units and you're like, cool, I'll sell those in 30 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and maybe be bankrupt. And also you don't know, I mean, I think the advantage to manufacturing stuff on my own is that I can see what's working in the market. So, you know, I can make a batch of 100 products you know, and just see how people respond. I can reach out to retailers. Hey, I have a new product. You want to try a few units? Um, and that's a huge advantage. And the further I get along in this process, the more thankful I am for that. Because, you know, say I had gotten, you know, a million dollars five years ago when I started the business. I mean, I probably still, I probably wouldn't have a business right now. 
it's, I mean, it's so true. Maybe, it's so but, true. Yeah. And you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm glad you're saying this because I hear so many entrepreneurs when they start, they start thinking too big. They start thinking immediately, oh, let me go and manufacture this overseas and get all these units. And they didn't even get to the point of experiencing the sales process and seeing any customer feedback. Whereas even if, and I tell people this all the time, if you look at buying a huge quantity because you got bigger gross profit margins, that may be true down the line. But to start with, you're better off with a small one and lesser your gross profit because you're not making as big of a mistake or if it's the product doesn't go or if you have any, you know, you don't want all your cash flow in the inventory as well. Now, while we're talking about past decisions that you had to make or chose to make both of them as you went through the you know growth stage another aspect because we talked about this a couple um sessions ago and i'm going to be talking about this tomorrow you started out as a sole prop which worked well for what you were doing you were doing a lot of consulting you were not really selling the products and then once you started selling the products which are in just you know teas and stuff is ingested so you've got a little risk there and then you also started selling those products in bigger retail outlets which is even more exposure it was then that you chose to become an llc now i remember and i'm going to have you tell the audience what you have to be concerned about you can't just use the same bank account can you you've got to make it so you understand that you've started over so since you had learned how to be a sole prop and now know how to be an llc tell us a little bit about that experience and what you learned through that process yeah, so I mean, when I was when I was running, I mean, when I switched to the LLC about a year ago, we had to, you know, I had to get a new bank. I didn't, I wasn't, you know, honestly going back, if I could, I would have started as an LLC because it was such a nightmare to switch over, um, you know, the new bank account, the new QuickBooks. Um, but you know, it was a really good learning experience, uh, and so. But when I started the LLC officially, you know, a couple years ago now, I also got, it also like, I got more serious too about really paying attention to my finances and making sure that I really reconcile all my statements, you know, every month. And just doing that exercise monthly has changed so much. Um, I cannot recommend it enough. Start as soon as possible to, Pay attention, pay attention to what's happening monthly um, in your finances. And, and, yeah, and you and know, and Abby, as, you're, as you're talking about this, I got to give a plug and I want you to continue on this, but I want everybody in the audience to know this. So Abby did not have any accounting background. I suggested that we do QuickBooks desktop, not the online. And I wanted her to be able to learn how to do enough of the accounting so she could properly manage her own books and was also looking at the numbers and learning from them. So going from no accounting background, we spent probably about three, four sessions getting you set up, which is normal for QuickBooks desktop. And then I launched Abby on her own, which like it always happens a mistake here or there. But at this point in time, you understand how to reconcile the bank account, reconcile your credit card, reconcile all your reports, make them zero out, balance out from absolutely no accounting background. So please continue and elaborate on that. But I wanted people to understand that you didn't come from this background and you're doing your QuickBooks on your own and you're using the desktop version, which is the more complicated, but much more powerful. So tell us a little bit about your experiences with that. Yeah, so I just, um, well, it's just a great way to keep it all organized and to really see, like, you know, how much money is coming in the month, what are my expenses, can I cut down on my expenses, like, you really need to zoom out and, and, and look at what's happening on the inside of the company, and this is a really great way to do that, and, and it's realistic, <laughs> you know, the numbers don't lie. Um, and, you know, it allows you to make changes along the way instead of like, 
a year and, you know, it being like October and you're like, oh, I haven't reconciled any of my statements the whole year. It's like you really have no concept then of how your company is doing financially, which is like scary. Then you're just like, you're operating in the dark at that point. Um, Doesn't she sound like a protege of me by saying that you have no idea how you're operating financially. It's very scary. I I'm just so proud. Okay. It's, but it's so true. I am saying that all the time. So I love when people come on and they can say, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm managing my finances. I'm looking at them. I now know where things are going. I can make adjustments. It makes such a difference. And then Tell us just briefly, you also have an entire set of Excel documents. What are you using them to tell you? What is the Excel documents telling you that your QuickBooks reports are not? Yeah, so the Excel document tells me that's really where you start to see like this, you know, it tells a story as Lori, you like to say, it's very true. When you, when you really, when you plug in the numbers in the Excel spreadsheet, it really tells an accurate story of what's happening um, with the company. And one of the reasons I like the Excel sheet is because, you know, whenever you're buying inventory, um, you know, you might spend like five grand on inventory one month. And then, you know, that's showing up in your monthly analysis on your profit and loss standards on your or statement on QuickBooks. So it's not really telling you like, um, you know, what the profitability is in this way, because, you know, you have these high and low numbers coming in on inventory. So the Excel spreadsheet is really nice because it actually, you know, breaks out the cost of goods. It tells you your gross margin. It tells you your profitability. Um, and you see what's selling, you know, oh, my wholesale on this collection is really, you know, consistently doing well. It's growing. Um, and then you can start to analyze those Excel spreadsheets month to month. And then you really start to get an accurate picture of am I profitable, be profitable because, you know, it's one thing to look at your bank statement and you see like, oh, money's coming in, money's going, but that does not tell you what's really happening. Um, and I think that that is so important to understand as soon as you possibly can um, to see whether you're actually profitable or not, because, you know, in the long run, that's, you know, that will make or break you. I know, and you had to recently make what most entrepreneurs would they say it's a hard decision and many wouldn't even be aware they had to make. You had to take some products and tell your distributors that you cannot, you know, offer those products to them because it did not have enough of a margin for you to sell. Now that didn't mean they weren't selling, but it wasn't profitable. And you had to say, no, I cannot sell those products. Number one, you wouldn't have even known that had you not been keeping up with the Excel documents. Number two, I don't know if you'd have enough confidence to even do that decision if it didn't stare at you in the face in the Excel. Tell us a little bit about that decision you just had to make, because that was a good example. Yeah, absolutely. I And it's really hard at the beginning to do this. Um, so, you know, I, have, I was uh, offering you know, a lot of my products wholesale. And, you know, recently when I started this new product line, I just made the decision, you know what, moving forward, I will only offer, you know, this collection wholesale. And people ask me all the time, oh, can I do the tinctures? Can I do your lollipops? And I just say no, because it just doesn't make sense. Um, and the margin is just too narrow um, for it to be successful long term. And in the beginning, it's really hard to do this. And the reason is, is because you're basically, you're saying no to money, you know, you're, and you need, you need cash flow, especially as a small business. So, you know, it was difficult to do that at first, but then the more you understand and have confidence around why you're doing that, um, the better off you are. And that's just a lesson that you have to learn, you know, that will come in handy, like, along your whole, you know, path of entrepreneurship is just because it might look like a good deal. It doesn't mean that it is for you. Um, yeah. and you have to be realistic. About what you know, and so do. many entrepreneurs, they just never learn that. They look at the sales. They look at the fact that somebody wants to buy it and they base their decisions only on, oh, 
it's selling, not is it profitable? And you can see, guys, that Abby is using the word profitable all the time. This was a word she never used before, which is so, so important. So let's go to the new products. And Lauren, if you can look up the new products on our website and throw them in the chat as we start talking about them. So where did the idea come from? What you what were you trying to achieve with this new product line? Just, you know, let, let's talk about the product itself. So, I mean, the idea came because, you know, we had had, well, so basically I, just to give you a little backstory, in the pandemic, my direct sales were doing really well. And in that time, I started backing off of wholesale a little bit. But, you know, there was a, there was a big multi-chain grocery store here in LA that I was selling my product in. And they said, hey, you know, we're going to drop your line if you don't get a distributor. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't lose this account. So um, I started talking to distributors. And that's when I had the real wake up call because you know distributors take 25% usually, you know, something around that. Retailers take 50. So that's a 75% you know, yeah. discount off your product. So once you start going in that direction, you really start to realize I need a, like, a lot of room in my margin to make this work. And that's really when I started having, you know, Lori and I, we had a lot of hard conversations yeah. about the reality of, of this of what I was trying to do and where I was trying to go. So I thought I have to make like a new product line. Um, it's like, do I, it kind of comes down to like, am I going to quit the business? Like, do I throw the towel in or do I, could I pivot? Could I make something else that still like has integrity, you know, like we all have a mission and there's a reason why we do what we do or make the service or product that we do. So I was just like laying in bed one night and I just, the light went off, the light, you know, bulb went off. I had the idea to do the bomb. I was like, oh my gosh, it's the bomb. Um, there can be one for everything, uh, you know, one for your face, one for your pet, one for your lips. Um, and I just, I love it. I love the product. Um, and it really helps people. Um, it's accessible. The price point is inviting. Um, you can sell it at the cash wrap. You know, you can sell it on the shelf. It's versatile. It could be sold in any store pretty much. Um, and that's ultimately kind of the direction that I'm headed in is, you know, I want to make a product that I can sell anywhere that has a low price point. So, that's how I came uh, up with the idea. For that. And what's really interesting, guys, what Abby was saying, and it's so true, and I talk about this a lot, people begin and they start making the product and then they're selling it at a price point and they're thinking, oh, this is great. But as you go down the road and you want to go wholesale, suddenly you don't have enough margin to be able to even offer it. And then the um, marketplace may be accustomed to that price. In fact, I remember this goes back a good amount of time, but there was a small company in LA that created a clothing line. And then they had somebody that was a celebrity on TV actually just come upon their product and say, isn't this the greatest? They got all these offers to sell it wholesale and they didn't have the profit and they had to say, no, they couldn't do it. They would have lost money. And so I always say, when you're starting your company, you have to be very conscious of these margins. Now on these um, bombs, one of them, and I, and I want you to, I'll give you enough so you know what I'm talking about. One of them's a lip balm that has an interesting, I'll just say powder in it. So let's say, let me, you know what I'm talking about. Tell us about that one. Yeah, so Viper Balm is uh, is doing really well. It's a moisturizing, spicy lip plumper. And the way it works is there is cayenne, cinnamon, and ginger, which are warming spices that actually dilate the blood vessels. So they bring blood flow to the lips, causing like, you know, it's a very gentle, subtle um, effect. And that one's just doing really well. Um, Isn't that cool? And, you know, okay, guys. Fun to follow that. Yeah, that's good. Cool. So. Tell us about, you do have one for furry friends. Tell us about that, mom. What's that used for? Yeah, so there's pet balm is for dogs and cats. And you really can use it on like any, you know, any part of the skin on an animal that needs help. Uh, a girl the other day uh, came to one of my pop-ups and 
She said it was really helping um, her cat's allergies. So like they had some, you know, allergies on the skin happening and it was really helping with that. Another friend has used it on her dog's hot spots. Um, it doesn't really like treat hot spots because that's like an allergic reaction, but it helps to just soothe the tissue um, and increase the healing time. For her dog, it helps with that. So yeah, it's just a multi-purpose skin product for, for pets. These, these are cool products, guys, aren't they? Okay, so now we got to talk about the sales and distribution. I'm going to give you my perspective on it, okay, Abby? <clears throat> All of a sudden, Abby, who I remember these calls going, Abby, you can't afford somebody to be doing the sales for you. You're just going to have to get on the phone. And this was Abby. I'm not comfortable. I'd rather just email people. Well, email's fine, but you're going to still have to get on the phone at times because you got to get these bigger pl places if you want to grow. Okay. And Abby, you got to be consistent. You got to make yourself do it. You can't wait till you're in the mood. That was many years ago. Introducing the new Abby. Tell us about how you went about getting these in the store, selling these products, the new and improved Abby that figured out how to do distribution and what it took. You, your cue, you tell us. <laughs> yeah, so in the beginning, I did not want to do it. And as I'm sure many, like, just like running, you know, there's so many things that I just didn't know going into running a business that you're going to have to do. And there have been a few over the years where I kind of have had a mini meltdown where I'm like, oh gosh, I have to do this too, you know? And it's like, it'd be great to hire someone, but you don't have the money to hire someone. So you just have to do it. You have to suck it up and do it. And in the beginning, it was sales for me. Um, and I do remember that, you know, like I would try to you know, reach out to three stores a day or something, you know, in the beginning, I had a whole messy Excel spreadsheet that I like barely could keep, you know, <laughs> keep track of. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't love it at the beginning, but now I love it. Um, and so I, you know, I've been, I've been doing wholesale pretty much from the beginning of starting the business. And, you know, I talked about this in the last show. I do feel like I jumped into doing wholesale too soon. So I wish I had just, you know, I wish I had known what I know now, but that's not how it works. No. Um, anyway, so I launched this new balm collection in June. And, you know, I really have been preparing for this to, like, make a product that I could get everywhere that I could really open the doors on distribution. And, you know, it took me a couple years to kind of figure it out because during the pandemic, direct sales were good. I was also trying, you know, some, I was, I was running some ads. Um, it wasn't that successful. And I just, and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to like pull away from doing wholesale. Like, I don't, I don't need it. I can just, you know, focus on this on direct sale. And then pretty quickly, you know, after the pandemic started to, um, you know, we started bouncing back a little, my sales started dropping a ton, my direct sales um, online. So I started thinking again about wholesale and, you know, making a product that had a good margin. Um, and so, yeah, I basically just prepared this product in a way that I hadn't done before by making sure there would be room in the margin for a distributor, you know, and a healthy margin to give to my retailers. So I launched it in June and I'm oh I'm in over a hundred stores now. And I, you know, once I was ready, I started re I was reaching out to like a hundred stores a week. Um for like And how were you reaching out, Abby? Tell us was it phone, email, how are you reaching out? And by the way, congratulations, guys. Can you admit, can you believe from June to now she's in 100 stores? That's why I wanted her to come back. So tell us, what did a day in Abby's sales life look like? How did you get in that many stores? What are the email or call or where did you get the numbers? Give us some details here that they can learn from. Yeah, so I, someone that I've been working with, um, who's kind of been helping me with marketing stuff, told me about there's, uh, there's this 
Answer, there's this website called reply.io. Basically, it lets you set up automatic sales flow emails. So you just plug in um, emails from, you know, for new retailers, and you can set up an automatic flow of outreach um, to try to send them. I mean, for me, I'm pushing getting samples into buyer's hands. So, you know, I'll reach out, introduce myself, and then I'll, you know, send a follow-up a few days later, like, can I send you samples? What's your address? And so I just really floored it with that. And um, with sending people, you know, I, I sent a lot of samples out to stores, too, because I could. Um, and that really helped a lot. So that's how I did it. Yeah, I just, you know, rigorously was, like, finding retailers, um, finding their emails on their website and just emailing them. Um, you know, not everyone has an email and some people don't get back to me. So I have a separate list for people that um, I haven't reached via email. And so then they're now on a call list. And so I, and that's on my to-do list is to start chipping away at the direct call also. Um, I remember you told me about that email app that you had been using before that was working really well. One of the people in the audience want to know, can you spell what that is so they can find that? And then Lauren can put it in the chat as well or tell us what that is. Because you you mentioned it. And if I understand correctly on it, Abby, it really helps because it's got an automated way of continuing to send out for the follow-up so you don't forget to send a follow-up. It keeps you kind of in the flow of sending out the communications. Did I describe what it does correctly? Exactly. Yeah, so it's called reply, R-E-P-L-Y dot I-O. Okay, perfect, perfect. And then when you do the sales calls, um, you know, most people struggle over the first words or the first sentence. You know, what do I say when they pick up the phone? Just you don't have to give us the exact words, but give us a feel for how do you communicate and keep in mind, guys, these are buyers for wholesale. So when you get somebody on the phone, how what how do we how do you go about communicating? Walk us through what that looks like. Um so usually I, you know, I'll say um I'm interested in being a vendor in your store who's the best person to talk to or Perfect. email. So I'm just inquiring about being a vendor or can I, um, I mean, that's usually where I'll start because people know immediately where to send you when you say vendor and that you have a product you wanna sell. Or you could say, you know, it just depends on the size of the store. Um, can I, can you connect me with your buyer in health and beauty? Um, I'm interested in being a vendor. So if you, you know, you can also specify what department, but, um, Usually the first thing you're called, the first person on the phone is not the person that you yep. necessarily need to be talking to. And I don't like to waste people's time by going on a whole spiel because they, that's not their area of expertise. So you can just cut right to it and say that you want to be a vendor. Who do you talk to? See, and that's perfect advice. I remember many years ago, I mean, decades ago, when I used to teach mm -hmm. selling scripts and, you know, how to do sales calls, I, I would find that, you know, if you call and you say, this is just an inquiry call, I'm trying to find the person to talk to who handles X. Because, you know, so many times people like to walk around, well, I got this product, and they start telling their whole life story. But when you're talking business to business, you literally say, this is who I want to talk with. Do about this and get with that person and then just say this is what I want too many people stumble over too many words during these kind of calls instead of getting to the point the person's like I'm busy what is it and then they get an attitude before they even know what you want so those, that's very good advice on how to approach yeah and then if I talk to the and then if I get the buyer on the phone I'll just say um you know, just keep it really short and sweet. Like yeah. they're busy. They don't want to hear your whole like life story about the product usually. So, you know, can I send you samples? What's your, get their, always get their contact. What's your email? Um, you know, just try to kind of be brief with it um, unless they're asking more questions. But, you know, typically it's like, you just want to cut 
cut to it and make it efficient for both parties. It, it, it's so true. And, you know, the ability to send samples, because I know last time we talked about you even sending samples of other products in the shipping when somebody's purchased. Now we're talking about a customer purchasing direct, send samples of other products. So anytime you can take any of your products and make miniature samples of them, you know, it's just a great opportunity to introduce new products. Now, Abby, also each of these type of distribution relationships have some kind of contract or maybe no contract or they pay certain terms. There's, in other words, a process, you have to go through their documents, you may have to fill out certain forms, et cetera. You've learned a lot over the last couple of years about how to set up these corporate type accounts. Just tell us a little bit about what, you, what it looks like, what people have to be aware of, anything you learned over the years to consider. Yeah, so I I don't, I actually, I would like to have a contract that people sign that just like outlines my terms, but I'm not that organized. And so I just, you know, in the email, I copy and paste my terms because people always want to know. Um, yeah. And I, I always, I mean, I really don't like to do net 30. Um, when you get into grocery and larger stores, that's just a requirement. So you just have to accept that. And that's, and that's fine. And I like working with grocery because they always pay you on time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so when it's smaller stores, I have people pay me before I ship the product. Yep. And I have gotten into, you know, over the years, like, it's awful. It's like, you're already wearing a lot of small hats as a business owner, like the last thing you want to do is be chasing down invoices mm -hmm. from your accounts. And these are relationships with people. So you don't want to be nagging, you know, a, you know, someone you're in a business relationship with about paying you. And so I like having people just pay me before. It just eliminates that whole mess. Um, and oh, cash flow, because you're having to have already bought the ingredients, paid for the commercial kitchen, paid for the packaging, mm -hmm. all that cash is out the door before you get the product ready to ship. So if then you offer 30 or 60 day terms, you're in a cash flow nightmare, which decreases your profit margin technically, because you're having to carry it with other money. So that's a very, very key point in managing cash flow as well. Do you run into situations where people just refuse to work with you? On that because everybody gets that in their head Abby if I ask to get paid nobody will work with me please dispel that math myth that's not true is no, it no I I have never had anyone do that right and you just have to think you know every time you buy inventory for your business to make your product do they like we're not we are not getting net 30 for all the places we're sourcing so I don't think stores expect that either. No, they really. don't. And I, I mean, think it's that people get insecure in their self. And so they're afraid to ask. And they're so afraid of losing the sale. They don't state the terms. They don't ask for the cash up front. They don't make these you know, choices. And they harm them internally. They harm them financially when they don't make those choices. So that's why I'm, I love it that you're telling people that this is the way it's working. So they see that they don't have to disadvantage themselves in that capacity. Yeah, and I also, you know, I, when I, I send my, I, I run all my wholesale accounts through, um, through QuickBooks. So I, and then I now started sending my invoices to re, to retailers um, through QuickBooks. And, you know, I put in there at the top, like your order's ready to ship. Orders don't ship until payments received. Please pay this invoice within, within seven days of receiving it. Um, and just being really clear up front, that helps just, that helps so much. Um, I love that, paid. Abby. And you know what else I always tell people is when you operate your company in that capacity and you state these are the terms pay this promptly it doesn't ship before it ships you get a different level of respect from the the, the stores that anybody the distributor you know one of my favorite lines is we teach people how to treat us 
And that is so true. And so when you go at it as a corporation, you get respected as such and you run into less problems because everybody knows how the game's played. You got to pay me, then you get the product. So that really matters. Yeah, and the other thing is, is that I don't require any order minimum. And I really like operating that way. And I like being flexible with my retailers on that. So if somebody needs like, Somebody could order two units of a product. I'll sell it to them. If they just want to see if it's going to work in their store, you know, and they're going to pay for shipping and pay me up front, I see no problem with that. And especially for smaller stores, you know, they want to know if the product's going to move. Um, right. And I think, too, the more confident you are with your product, which, you know, I'm becoming with this one, it's easier to do that. Like, oh, you know, I think I'm pretty sure it's going to actually do really well. But if you wanted to start with six units, no problem. And that's another thing, you know, it also then feels better and a little more flexible to, you know, to, to have them be paying you up front too. Because I'm not asking them for $1,000 up front. I'm like, they can, you know, give me $100 or $500 order. And that's fine, but these are, you know, these are the, the terms. And yeah, that yeah, makes sense to me. That's a really good business decision because they're paying the shipping. It's not costing you any more to do the two versus 22 or what have you, whatever number you want to say, because of the way you're producing it. And it gives them an ability to that old expression, put their toe in the water and see. And then, you, you know, one of the things I remember you saying to me just recently, Abby, and this was when maybe July or August. So you were just starting into this, that you were getting more reorders for this product than you had gotten for other products that you were just getting a ton of reorders. Is that still happening? And are you seeing when they're reordering, they're ordering more? Yes, I am. And it's a really great thing. <laughs> Don't you love experience. that smile? <laughs> it's really I, nice. I mean, one example is like, you know, there's this store, little grocery store here in LA and I know the owner and she's just like, you know, you, she's really sweet. She's like, you can sell whatever you want here. So, you know, I probably had my tinctures and powders on her shelf for, you know, I had them on her shelf for years and I would, I was barely, I mean, they were barely moving for years. Um, and immediately, so I went in one day and I said, you know what, I'm going to, swap out all this product. I'm just giving you balms. Let's put them by the cash register and let's see how it goes. And within like a few weeks, they had sold out and, you know, they still continue to move really well there. And it's just a really nice, it's really a nice feeling when you're making a product that's finally moving. Um, so it took me a long time to figure that out. <laughs> you know, it, it's the, that old word, persistence. I mean, Abby, you, you mentioned it several times, and I want everybody in the audience to know we had hard discussions. It was, well, Abby, you may have to just shut it down or go back to doing more consultations because they paid you, you know, and, and but you've always from day one had this dream, you wanted to create products that people bought and have them for sale in many different places. I mean, you are finally living it. And I even remember when you first was looking at the pet products, you thought, well, I'm going to go to the dog part and meet pet owners. I'm like, that's not going to get you enough sales. You know, so you had been thinking about these situations where you could sell one or two, but not really analyzing, wait a minute, I have to sell a lot of these to make the amount of money because they're what I call gumball sales and gumball sales are the smaller priced items. You got to sell a lot of gumballs. And so once you started um, focusing on where can I get the exposure to get my products in. And what I love about round two is that in round one, you were desperately searching and paying for marketing people and social media ads, et cetera, trying to get exposure. And it was just costing you money. And this time you just rolled up your sleeves and jumped into it. And I think that because you were representing your own products that you love and you just jumped into it and did it, it's led to the success that you have, not to mention, you know, falling down a lot and scraping your knees, you knew what to do. So it's that continuing to go, how do you, like, 
you know, when, when you were at that desperate moment, if the Abby went into the room to give the other Abby the pep talk, what would they say? So you can give our audience, because I'm, I, we got, by the way, we've had up to 71 people on this show, Abby, <laughs> not to make you nervous near the end of it, but you had a, you had a large audience. So I have to believe there's one or two in this audience that's feeling like you did back then. What words would you say to tell them to keep going or what have you? Um, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to change what you're doing if it means that you'll be able to keep doing what you want to be doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I think it's easy to get it. I was really attached to my first sort of line of product. And it took me too long to realize that it wasn't going to get me to where I wanted to be with the business. Um, and I, but the thing is that I still sell those products to my online customers. So it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, tear it all down and start new. It just means you might have to change a little, or it might not be what you thought it was going to be in the beginning. And that's okay. Um, the other thing I like, I like to do this exercise where I imagine, you know, my dream account coming to me like tomorrow and, and then walking through, you know, the, and then, so say my dream account comes tomorrow and they're like, hey, we want to stock your product in 200 stores. You know, it's like, am I ready for that? Probably, no, I'm not. So I think that you need to prepare for where you want to be. You need to start preparing for that, for that day to come where that, you know, larger retailer might come to you. What do you need to do to be ready for that? And that's just an exercise that I do with myself all the time, every day. And it's like, you know, now I have this new collection, but there's still so much to refine within it to get it to a place where it can grow into wider distribution. Um, so if you're making your product now, like start, like always be kind of like two steps ahead of yourself. Um, if you're making it yourself, how am I going to offload production? Start like get it in line so that you, when you are, when that, person comes to you to get into the bigger store, you're prepared for it, or you at least know what you need to do to get there. That's beautiful words, Abby. And it's so true because I have seen companies over the years that kind of got, you know, it's, it's two part. You have to focus on where you are now, but you have to look and investigate, think, and sometimes research what you would do if this opportunity came, because sometimes when the opportunity comes, you don't have enough time to do that research and thought process. And commonly, when people just stick their head down and just try to work harder, it doesn't work. You know, you need to be working more efficient. So I love the experiment, the thought experiment, as I call it, that you're doing where you're looking down the road to figure out where you're going to go to next. So speaking of down the road, where are you seeing the company go where are you dreaming for around the corner what, what's tomorrow going to look like for you yeah so i am so i'm fine i'm finally ready to work with the distributor and so next year i'm going to start working with just a small local distributor um so you know a few years ago i was i talked about this on the last show i got into like my dream store in la multi-chain grocery store I learned so many lessons in that process and my product in that store was wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, eventually they dropped the line because I didn't have a distributor. And I think this is an important lesson, you know, as we all know, like never burn your bridges. So now, you know, I got in touch with them again, like a couple months ago, and I'm like, hey, I have a new line. And so I'm working to get back into that store with the new collection. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that entails like having display boxes, um, having a distributor. So I'm going to start going in that direction, but also like still moving very slowly. Um, uh, because, you know, a lot of grocery stores require free fill. So you have to give them free product, and then once they sell it, they start sending you POs. Um, that's pretty common across the board. So if you, you know, if I were to try to get into like 200 gro grocery stores, like I could go bankrupt pretty quickly yeah. by just doing free fill. 
So there's still like room has to be a lot of strategy um, with growing and not growing too fast and making sure you have the capital to, you know, grow at a steady pace. So next step is working with the local distributor, getting back into this like smaller chain, but just kind of like getting in there and just seeing how it goes and like trying to make it a success because if you can make it a success in one, then it's likely you can copy what you did there and do it in the next one and move very slowly with that process. So wonderful words. So, so everybody, I, I want to just do a summary. Abby's business, five years old, five years ago, no business background, no desire to sell, no finance background whatsoever, no understanding about any kind of distribution, no understanding about manufacturing. Abby today is here with a successful product in over a hundred stores as of today, who knows where tomorrow will be. And I also know she moved into a bigger apartment and just bought a new car, I believe, if I recall correctly, when I didn't even know if she was going to be able to pay the rent five years ago. So you can see, and this is the part I really am so excited to have Abby on. She didn't talk any big business terms or anything, simple, persistence, common sense, looking at your gross margins, taking on what you're uncomfortable with, paying attention to your numbers and knowing when something's not working, accepting it and going down another road. Abby, you are a model of success. I know your parents are so proud of you. I know that as well. I'm so proud of you. And I'm just so thankful that you have come back on and shared with everybody what you shared today because in many ways, yes, business is complicated, but success is simple. Simply taking steps one after another and not getting ahead of yourself and not getting like I always like to call Hollywood. Abby, you're just the you you're just the to me genuine and pure in your approach, and you've just taken it simple. And I'm just so proud of you. So thank you so much for being here, Lauren. I'm going to get you back on to finish us up today. Thank you. What a great show and congratulations, Abby. Oh my goodness. I had no idea about the hundred um, stores and just uh, from the first interview to today. I mean, amazing. So Abby, you're getting a ton in the chat, by the way. Congratulations. Awesome. Genuine and pure. <laughs> Abby, you know, you are getting, you, you've done well helping everybody today and everybody saying thank you. I want you to know that. And I want to yeah. say thank you so much for everybody that joined us. I was so excited. Did you see where we were like 74 at one point, Laura? And I looked down. I'm Crazy. amazed. So my heart goes out to the frequent flyers. Thank you so, so much for being here. And all the people that came here today, thank you so much. I hope to see you every single week. I'm just so proud of everyone that we bring on the show. And I'm so thankful that they will tell our, their story because I think that hearing about real people and real stories is what everybody needs to know when they look at how do I get where I want to go? How do I experience my dream? And that's what it's all about. Okay, Lauren, I know you're going to stay a little bit late, finish things up for me. I'm out of here. I will see everybody next week on Small Biz Talk. Bye. Bye, Lori. Thank you. Bye, Abby. All right, everyone, be sure to take a look at the chat. I've got links for um, a, a few of you actually have asked about recording succession. Um, oh, thanks, Diane. <laughs> um, recording. So please go to our YouTube playlist. You'll see in the chat that there's a link to our YouTube and uh, you can access them there. I've also listed information related to how you can get in contact with Lori. Um, I have Abby's information in there, that Viper bomb that she mentioned is in the chat, as well as uh, uh, links to her website. So be sure to support her. Uh, and thank you again for joining us for another episode of Small Biz Talk, Solutions for Your Small Business. We will see you next week at 10 a.m. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Bye.